Hi people, welcome to Blue Cage Jazz Engine in Blue Bell. One of the things I like to share with people is not only information about professional dancing into alternative routes into professional dancing is important. And I came one of the individuals who, when I came a professional dancer, I shared information with people in my community and wider communities. I created programs sharing with individual routes into professional dancing or to doing dance in general. Yeah? Um, in a bigger, better and bolder way, which was important because a lot of people engage in dance and they come from it from different perspectives. Mainly a lot of the dancers I came to meet who who were ballet dancers and contemporary dancers, when I went to ballet school from the age of 16, I went to a private school. I was the only black person in that school and I was only, not only black person, one of two blacks, it was a female and I was the only black male in that school and I actually persuaded the teacher, the ballet teacher, to take me as a ballet teacher, tap dancer, modern jazz dancer. That was my start on the road to becoming a professional in the mainstream world. And how did I do that and why did I do that? What happened, I wanted to be a stage dancer. The prerequisite to being a stage dancer, you had to have done ballet. You have to do tap, you have to do modern. You want to be in musical theatre, which I wanted to be musical theatre. You have to go down the road of musical theatre training. And it changed because what happened was historically before the 50s, really musicals changed where they had dancers coming from established schools of ballet, contemporary, and ballet, ballet and modern dance. Before vernacular dancers, people who self-trained themselves were the people in the musicals. Going back to Sammy Davis Jr., Sammy Davis Jr.'s family, the Nicholas brothers, the Berry brothers, uh, the Dandridge sisters, they'd come through a different rites of passage to be professionals. It's important for people to understand. And as an individual, there was a prerequisite. So what happened was people were unaware secretly I was going to classes. Contemporary dance class, I was going to drama class. I was going to musical theatre classes because I wanted to not only be in them, and most people wanted to be in I wanted to write them, I wanted to direct them, I wanted to produce them, and I wanted to promote them. And people got this. It's important that people understand. Because most people I met were just happy to be professionals in them. And many people hadn't done their own musicals. Well, the irony of that, I already did my own sort of musical theatre play from the age of eight. And I'd been doing that between eight to the age of 16, right in my own plays. And people got that. Now, one of the things that happened to me as an individual, I went to college to do A-levels uh, and do repeat O-levels. Now, a negative situation arose. And the dance teacher, I brought in my portfolio of plays that I'd written and designs I'd done for a piece that I wanted to develop, yeah? And it was basically The Adventures of Swing Kid was stories that I created and I brought them in in a portfolio to show the dance teacher. And what happened was, in the, in the college, what happened was I was on the sports, involved in sports. Now, sports people didn't like the fact I was doing dance. Do you understand? And doing art. It was a big thing because what happened... Basically, sports people in the world, my knowledge of sports, being sports excellence, when you dance, individuals try to put on you that you're feminine if you dance, you're a woman if you dance. Dance is a woman's thing and the art is a woman thing. You're wuss, you're soft if you do the arts. That was a big thing that from the school I'd come from, which was Stretford School. They're very much against arts and very much against dance. You need to understand, yeah? So I thought, basically, I wouldn't get this in the college, but I did. So what happened was, people I brought a portfolio in, and a portfolio room. People took, took, took my portfolio and destroyed, destroyed my portfolio, my stories and whatever. Now, they're the only stories I had. So there was master copies of basic scripts that I wrote. They were master copies. I didn't do no other copies. Cause I didn't think I needed to have to do any copies. But the story I'm about to tell you what can happen. As a professional dancer, you need to make sure that you have master copies and other copies of work that you do because my work got destroyed. Do you understand? I had ideas for plays, etc. that I wanted to do with people at the Retta and what happened, it was destroyed. And it's important for people to understand. Now, that happened in 1981. After two weeks being at the college, I left because of that because I knew I'm not going to be in a college where people are going to be doing that to me and it's going to lead to altercations and I don't want to be involved in any violence with anybody or anything like that. So I left 
to the dismay of the dance teacher, which was Maxine Thomas, a very beautiful woman who died of cancer later on as an individual. And what happened, she was a beautiful woman and she gave me my start, which was in, in, in Loretta College. She very much saw that I had talent and she wanted to help me with that talent. And she supported me by giving me insight into books. Now, what happened, Maxine Thomas had a master's and that is important. Maxine Thomas very much engaged me to try to learn about research. Yeah, you know I mean, she very much, she loved to see what I was doing. That's why I brought my portfolio in for her to see the research I'd done. So she was shocked to know about a UK underground jazz dance scene that existed. I brought in materials sharing with these are records, a list of these are records, what we do. These are some pictures of us dancing, etc. So she got an understanding what my dream was for musical theatre. I had my own dream to promote my own work to choreograph my own work, that people got that. And why I'm saying this, because people have to understand the journeys that people come from, because people try to make out that my discipline for the dance came from ballet, it never did. People try to make out my knowledge of dance, my knowledge of physiology on dance came from ballet, from having a ballet teacher, it never did. It came from my mother. In my household, my mother's the first person I know did yoga. My dad and my mother used to do keep fit in the house. And my mum used to have DIY books. My mum wanted to be a nurse. She had a skeleton. She had books on physiology, anatomy, and she taught her kids to look after their health. My mum encouraged us and my dad to encourage us to be in sports, to look after our health. Yeah? And what happened, they came to me, the talents that led to me becoming a professional dancer. Because they led to me having an understanding you have to have the athleticism to be a dancer and you have to have discipline. And the discipline came from my parents. The discipline came from my community who involved himself in dance. Because we used to dance every day. So you have to have the discipline to dance every day. I already had that already. And people try to attribute this to me being involved in Western dance. It was Western dance that gave me, you know, the aptitude. They didn't. My parents gave me the aptitude. And this is one of the key things I wanted to share with the world. And I shared that with individuals throughout the world. As a professional dancer, the guy to going pro. It's important for you to share with people your alternative journey, better alternative journey. Because what happened, what happened, I'm meeting many African diaspora dancers and other dancers don't, don't attribute their parents as being contributed to their dance discipline, their dance development, their dance enthusiasm, enthusiasm their dance aptitude, their dance capabilities. Do you understand? It's important. You had an auntie, I had an auntie who always encouraged me to dance. I was very shy. She's always dancing me at parties. Every party that we have in our community, she was there. She'd come and come and dance with me. She, she encouraged me to be more self-expressive, just like my parents, and to self-express myself through dance. And she has to be knowledge. Do you understand? She did it all the time till I was doing it myself. I say, come on, auntie, let's dance. She did that, and that's what our community does. Because what happens is, again, Western society has been contributed to saying, well, our dance brought the kids to be self-expressive and creative. Well, you can't teach African diaspora kids to be self-expressive and creative because they learned that from the home. You have to understand we come from a culture of a great African nation. And that secondly, we come from a culture where the Caribbeans celebrate the emancipation of slavery. And you have to see that. You have to see carnival in the Caribbean. It's a totally different type of energy in the Caribbean till it is in the UK. And it is in the US. You have to see carnival there. Because it means something that's important. The emancipation of slavery was important. The end of colonialization was important. So these two things were things. Massive self-expression comes into community. And self-expression was important for them as an individual for them to survive. Because they never self-expressed themselves through celebration activities. What happened? They would be dead. They would never have survived slavery. And they would never have to survive colonialization. So people need to understand when I talk about the guide to going pro, you need to understand within West Indian culture how people develop themselves to be pros. Many of them self-develop themselves to lead themselves to be professional dancers. And that's one of the key things which is important. And what I've done, I'm probably the first person, one of them, to map the journey. Because I never wanted to be pro in the way that people pro without as a professional career full time. That led me to using the dance in wider ways. So what happened, one of the key things, and it happened accidentally, was I used dance from eight years old to build my confidence, to improve my writing, to improve my spontaneity, 
to improve my ability to improvise on the spot, write on the spot and read on the spot. To read on the spot, why? Because I was in a Catholic school where I was being ridiculed because I couldn't pronounce words because I had dyslexia, unknown. And what happened, I wasn't quick to read and I wasn't quick to write. So what happened, it was embarrassing for me and I wanted to break the embarrassment and stop how I was feeling. And I did that proactively by creating a character called the Adventures of Swing Kid. I said, I'm gonna do my own play and I did it in the Caribbean. I was encouraged by a teachers in the Caribbean and they were black teachers because they made me feel comfortable at who I was. They made me to feel comfortable in my culture. But in my white school, what happened was basically they made me feel uncomfortable and the society made me feel uncomfortable. So I was withdrawn. I went into myself. So every word I pronounced wrongly, you get a snigger. The teacher never stopped it. And we had to do it in front of the class. It wasn't private. So I decided if I'm going to go through my life, I need to make change. And so that made me courageous. Because my parents had a quote that said, don't let barriers stop you from achieving. I had a barrier the way I read. that I couldn't write, so I had to improve. They helped that improvement take place, but I started it in the Caribbean. And they started it by sending me to the Caribbean to toughen myself up, to get a positive mental attitude, understand the hardships they had gone through to, for me to get to a free school educational system. They're paying taxes. They're paying taxes for me to get an educa a better education. So they, I can be more free-spirited. I can do more things for my family. And when you have purpose to living, that changes who you are. So when I came a pro, there was something, a reason why I came a pro. Because, one, I was having problems in, because of my dyslexia, I couldn't get my O-levels. But secondly, what happened was I realised my focus in dance, me dancing, enabled me to show my art, my culture has dignity, my culture has, has grace, my culture has elegance. And I wasn't the only dancer in the world that ever thought that. The father of jazz decided he's going to use dance for that same thing. The mothers of jazz decided to use that thing. All the tap dancers who came from the slums, came from suburbs, their biggest thing was to travel the world to show that African diaspora people had elegance, they had dignity, and they had respect for themselves. They used the art. Paul Robeson used it. So Paul Robeson was a lawyer. He used it. Many people went into the arts, the commercial industries, to break stereotypes. That is one of the reasons I became a dancer. And it's important for people to understand, going pro, I had a core mission statement. I didn't just go pro, I looked ahead. In 1981, I made a core mission statement. And that mission statement is to promote the positive images and energy of my African and African cultural heritage arts and wider uses. And people got that. And it's wider uses. Because as African diaspora people, we used it for, to develop people's leadership skills, communication skills, their health, their healing, help them to build bonding between the community, to build bridges <coughs> between communities, bring about social cohesion. We used it proactively and that legacy has not been identified. So I'm one of the individuals decided, you know, as a pro, I don't only, I do what Catherine Dunham did. Catherine Dunham made sure she learned all the social dances and she brought them on stage to dignify them. And then she did lectures at the Royal Society in Britain and around the world. She did lectures identifying the dances have a significance, they have a role and purpose in the community and what's happened, this has not been recognised. And without me doing this, because of the biases from phonology in the 1700s, because of slavery, slavery portrayed black people, all their culture, they don't have a culture. Black people don't have no customs. They don't have no art forms, which was untrue. So she did talks, that's the same thing what I do. And I started to do talks to the artists because an artist must have a purpose for their leadership. And one of the key things, some artists don't. They're jumping from here to there, boom. My work, when I came in to be a contemporary dance, com to be a contemporary, con contemporary dance founder for the first ever contemporary dance company, I joined it because it had the focus to enable me to break stereotypes about me. One, we did dance education. So I was involved as first one of a few black people in dance education. One of the few people involved in dance in the community. One of the individuals involved in dance in theatre through tours. And one of the individuals involved in dance in the commercial industries. Yeah. And it enabled me to have a voice. And that's what African diaspora people look for as a leader. Going pro, people have the reasons and it's important that you define the story. So what's happening now, we're in the 21st century. People are asking, what is your story? My story into dance started in my home. From me seeing musicals. And me seeing a particular musical called Cabin in the Sky 
from stormy weather. I wanted to be a musical theatre dancer and I started to write and do sketches. Me and my brother did. That's how it happened. And we understood the significance of the clothes. I was a politicised child. And what's not happened is when the politicised individuals have been written out of history, I'm a specialist in my field. I can tell you more information about my social dance than most people can because I started to do research into the role and function of it going back into great African kingdoms. I looked at great African kingdoms in other parts of the world where they brought their dances, their high level of art and music. I was an individual started to independently and with organisation, with companies to start to break the stereotypes that African diaspora people's arts and African arts has no significance. It does have a significance because we would never be here without our arts. Our arts are integral to who we are socially, physically, intellectually, culturally, emotionally, creatively, emotionally and spiritually, politically, economically, technologically, environmentally. We had great African kingdoms with royalty and people need to understand that. And there was a function for the arts with the royal, within the royal family. There was a function for the arts, for the community. Kings and queens danced in front of their community. So they had dances for different purposes. The clothes were symbolic. We have been given an impression, you know, the status, wearing clothes for status reasons is a European thing. It's not a European thing. It's a global thing. Because most places had royalty. All the places you know of royalty is important for people to, to look into them in respect to dance and what dance meant in the royal family and the clothes that they wore. There were statuses. So if you look into Asia, you realise that great, Afri great kingdoms in Asia, they had great kingdoms in Africa and the great kingdoms in the West, Western society. Blue K Jazz Dance Out, talking about the guide to going pro, that some people come from an alternative perspective and you must know the difference between what happened in the vernacular and great African kingdoms. You must know the, the importance of the vernacular development of tap dancers, be it in the streets, in the slums, and being in the suburbs, at docks. And you must know the development that happened from 1950, where now what happened was new thinking came from. Dance schools is where jazz, where the dancers came from. And what happened was it was harder for people who had not been trained to get dance. And I talk about my journey, recognising that, that for me to become a dancer, as a stage dancer, with companies and whatever, I needed to do the prerequisite, which was to learn ballet, which was to learn tap, which was to learn modern, was to learn how to sing, was to learn how to play music. And I talk about my journey and I talk about the challenges I had with undiagnosed dyslexia as a thorn in my side in learning to read music, in learning to remember lines and what I did about that. And then eventually how I developed to become a professional dancer of live improvisational work. And the live improvisational work is in this being part of the face of mixed movement. This is amazing for me to be able to show to others because my dream was to be a live improvisational performer in some of the biggest events that has ever been in the UK. And this was one of them that took place from 2009 to 2011. This festival was transatlantic, its first of its time, groundbreaking, the first of its kind in UK, the first of its type in the world. You must understand the significance of me being involved in it. It then went on to be part of the La Mama Moose Festival. That was very, very important in 2012 to be the Ed Mix movement in that with the Culture Hub supporting them and contact. That was this mixed movement movement was the first biggest event, art, technology, improvisational dance event ever done in the history of La Mama Moves in New York. And what happened, the amazing story, when I talk about the guide to going pro, what happens as an individual is this. This was a landmark, I don't think I'm ever gonna beat that. My dream was to dance in New York because the father of jazz had come from there. Most of the music I have from jazz, if you know anything about progressive, progressive music, you'll know that a lot of it 